There's another word for master narratives. It's called history. <laughs> Basically, every country creates their own narrative story. And and you know, my old job at the State Department was what people used to joke as the chief propagandist job. We haven't talked about propaganda. Propaganda. I'm not against propaganda. Every country does it, and they have to do it to their own population. And I don't necessarily think it's that awful. And this idea of a of a of a uh, car news cartel. I mean, I, I, I was editor of Time in 2012 uh, during that election, and I remember, you know, you're competing against cartels and everybody. I remember being on a panel with the then editor of the New York Times, who said it's really hard to break through these days. This is the editor of the New York Times saying it's hard to break through. I almost I wanted to jump off the platform. Like, what's it like for the rest of everybody? So I mean, there, there's no. I mean, there are cartels, but cartels don't have hegemony like they used to. The gentleman right there, last question. I don't think you all address an issue hmm. in terms of understanding what happened in the world. Because what is happening in America is what I'm, the United States flipped on the global south and in the third world, which we live with for many, many years in terms of a master narrative that was was and still is propaganda. You know what? I hate last questions. <laughs> Don't you? I never, I usually just want to end something before the last question. Um, but at any rate, I want to thank this fantastic panel here today. Um, and I, and I, I do want to say, I actually think, I mean, the talk about optimism, I mean, the optimism is all, is all of you there figuring out how to teach your students about this and using some of the techniques and some of the sources uh, that we've talked about here today. And I hope you're successful. Thank you very much. Oh, oh, good job, everyone. Good panel. All right, now let's pack up and go home. Ooh, indeed. James Corbett here, CorporateReport.com, with your propaganda watch for this week. And this week we are dissecting a conversation that took place at the Council on Foreign Relations back in May of last year. Uh, it's posted on the net under the title Combating Disinformation and Fake News. And it's uh, hosted by Richard Stengel, and there's a few people on the stage that are of note, one of whom is a representative of the Data and Society Research Institute, which should ring a bell for regular viewers of this program. Yes, you remember the Data and Society report about the intellectual dark web and somebody talked to somebody who once knew somebody who was in the same room as somebody whose aunt's grandma once borrowed a car from somebody who knew this person and therefore they're related. <laughs> that tangled heap of nonsense, remember that? Yeah, that was the Data and Society Research Institute. And of course, they're there at the Council on Foreign Relations lecturing people on what is how to combat dis disinformation and fake news. And... The whole shebang is presided over by Richard Stengel, who you heard there defending domestic propaganda because, well, every country has to do it. I'm, I'm a fan. I think, I think we should do this. Richard Stengel, now who's that, you might ask? Well, he just happens to be the former editor of Time magazine and the former Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy. Let that sink in for a moment. Don't just let those titles glaze over. Think about that for a moment. The former editor of Time magazine and the former Undersecretary of State for public diplomacy. What a beautiful euphemism for propaganda. And he's up there at the Council on Foreign Relations talking about how great domestic propaganda is and how we need it. Hmm. There's there's an important relationship to be pointed out there. And then, of course, yeah, there all, all of this is taking place under the umbrella of combating disinformation and fake news. <laughs> I mean, it's, just, it's irony and hypocrisy on top of irony and hypocrisy. It's turtles all the way down. Uh, it's hilarious, in a sense, if it wasn't so important. Which, unfortunately, it is. Because what we are talking about here is the control of information by governments and uh, the manipulation of information by governments in order to influence their populations into going along with this plan, supporting that plan, not recognizing that there's a danger or a threat over here, looking this way while they go this way. Many different ways that, of course, propaganda can be used, which we dissect here on a regular basis. But it is interesting to note that that coalescence of the 
media and government all coming together into one so the lines are blurred. And this will not be particularly new, I know, or shocking to my regular audience, but it is worth noting and picking this apart. Now, the first thing that happens when you start talking about domestic propaganda for Americans, at any rate, people will bring up the smith munt Act of 1948, which was an act of Congress. It was uh, put into law, obviously, in 1948, that did put in some barriers towards the, prop- the dissemination of U.S. State Department propaganda within the United States. So this is State Department propaganda created by its various media tentacles around the world, um, and this smith munt Act supposedly kind of stopped it from prop- disseminating that propaganda within the United States internally. Now, that was repealed in 2013 as part of the NDAA of 2013, the smith munt Act uh, Modernization Act of 2012 was rolled into the NDAA 2013, got passed. So a lot of headlines at that time were screaming about, oh, look, they've repealed smith Month and now it's legal to propagandize to Americans. Well, yes and no. I mean, there's more to that story because, as you note, that was just one sliver of something that the smith Month Act did. They, they It prevented the State Department's various media tentacles around the world, Radio Free Liberty and all of that from disseminating information within the United States. But that didn't exactly stop or even pretend to stop uh, dissemination of propaganda more broadly within the United States. Of course, that has been going on the whole time and it continues to go on and it had nothing to do with Smith Hunt. So Smith Hunt was important, but not not the be all and end all when we talk about dissemination of propaganda in the United States, U.S. government propaganda to U.S. citizens. There's a number of things that supposedly kind of put limits or restrictions or restraints on the ability of the U.S. government to uh, disseminate propaganda internally, but they didn't do a very good job of it, as you can imagine. Uh, One example, U.S. Code uh, Title V, Section 3107, the Gillette Amendment of 1913, um, states quite clearly, appropriated funds may not be used to pay a publicity expert unless specifically appropriated for that purpose. That's kind of a bit of a restraint on the on on the unrestrained use of propaganda in one sense uh you have usc title 10 section 2241a which reads funds available to the department of defense may not be obligated or expended for publicity or propaganda purposes within the united states not otherwise specifically authorized by law (laughs) so as long as you know as long as congress passes a law saying it's okay then it's okay well okay again it's a type of restraint uh you even have uh a a part of the annual appropriations bill for congress every year since 1951 has contained the phrase no part of any appropriation contained in this or any other act shall be used for publicity or propaganda purposes within the united states not heretofore authorized by the congress again as long as congress says it's okay then it's okay but but again so there's all these kinds of checks and, and restraints that have been put in place that sound good and theoretically you know in a perfect system run by angels this would this would would hamper the government from disseminating propaganda. Of course it doesn't. And you know that because you, knowingly or not, have no doubt been exposed to government propaganda in your life, packaged, of course, as news. When President Bush signed the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act into law last month, millions of people who are covered by Medicare began asking how it will help them. This is going to be the same Medicare system, only with new benefits, more choices, more opportunities for enhanced benefits. Most of the attention has focused on the new prescription drug benefit that takes effect in 2006. Then all people with Medicare will be able to get coverage that will lower their prescription drug spending. In the meantime, Medicare will offer some immediate help through a discount card. There will be more than one to choose from. In June of this year, seniors will have access to a drug discount card that Medicare endorses, giving them between 10 to 25 percent discounts on their prescription drugs. And lower income seniors get additional help, a $600 credit. Starting in 2005, the law also provides new preventive services, like a physical exam for all beneficiaries within the first six months of enrollment in Medicare. This preventative benefit, along with others, including cholesterol screening, diabetes screening, and heart disease screening, should help seniors stay healthy and have a better quality of life. 
Medicare officials emphasize that no one will be forced to sign up for any of the new benefits. It's completely voluntary. Seniors will be able to partake of the new Medicare system or the old Medicare system. The new law, say officials, simply offers people with Medicare ways to make their health coverage more affordable. In Washington, I'm Karen Ryan reporting. All right, now probably few remember this at this time, but back 15 years ago, this was a big story. No, not the story that you just watched. That that was just someone reporting for, I don't know, CBS or NBC or one of the one of the BS networks, I don't know. Doesn't matter. Uh Wait, no, it didn't say any affiliate or any network name. Who who was that? Karen Ryan reporting from Washington? Hmm. Oh, that's right. That's Karen Ryan, who was hired by the Department of Health and Human Services, working for a PR firm uh, hired by HHS to, pre- to present a basically a video news release for the HHS on behalf of some Medicare propaganda that the government was hoping to float at the time. That wasn't a news piece at all. It was a PR puff piece. But it's packaged like a news piece and shipped off to all the various networks and affiliates and tentacles of the U.S. media propaganda mill so that it will be run. Hey, guys, you guys need a story for tonight's 6 o'clock news? Here's one. It's all packaged and ready to go for you. You just introduce it and play. And there's a minute and a half of your news coverage covered. Wait, this is actually specifically from, produced by a PR firm contracted for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. This is literally... PR propaganda, as you will note by the the sit down interview with the the the, the, the U.S. government representative, who's clearly reading a script. And <laughs> it's just this is as packaged and phony as it gets. But wait, and that became a big story at the time. Karen Ryan and this fake report, and the New York Times picked it up. And hey, did you know there's this whole video news release thing going on, and they're packaging propaganda as news? Well, actually, yeah, it'd been going on for a very long time. Many it had been employed many times. Um, but it became a big news uh, to the point where you know, even President Bush had to had to answer for the use of this domestic propaganda. Uh, Mr. President, earlier this year, you told us you had ordered your administration to cease and desist on payments to journalists uh, to promote your agenda. You cited the need for uh, ethical concerns and the need for a bright line between the press and the government. Your administration continues to make the use of video news releases, which are prepackaged news stories sent to television stations, fully aware that some or many of these stations will air them without any disclaimer that they are produced by the government. Controller General of the United States this week said that raises ethical questions. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? Uh, There there is a Justice Department opinion that says these... um, these pieces are within the law so long as they're based upon facts, not advocacy. And I expect our agencies to adhere to that ruling, to that Justice Department opinion. Uh, this has been a long-standing practice of the federal government uh, to use uh, these uh, types of videos. The Agricultural Department, as I understand, has been using these videos for a long period of time. Uh, the Defense Department, other departments have been doing so. It's important that, the, that they be based upon the guidelines set out by uh, the Justice Department. Now, I also I think it would be helpful if local stations then disclose to their viewers if that's, you know, that this was based upon a, a factual report and they chose to use it. But evidently in some cases that's not the case. So anyway. To guarantee that's happening by including that language in the prepackaged report. Yeah, I don't, you know, look, I mean, oh, you mean a disclosure? I'm George W. Bush, and I... Well, some way to make sure it couldn't air without the disclosure that you believe is so vital. Uh, you know, Ken, I mean, there's a, there's a there's a procedure that we're going to follow, and the local stations ought to, if there's a deep concern about that, ought to tell their viewers what they're watching. As I say, the story did get some attention at the time. It did explode a little bit. The Government Accountability Office, for its part, repeatedly ruled that uh, the VNRs went against the laws and should not be used. But the Bush administration at the time just slapped that down and said, "Ah, we think it's a question of government intent. So too bad for you. 
and they could continue to do it. <laughs> um, so uh, again, Smith Munt didn't exactly prevent much, and it was more or less mute by the 21st century anyway, because you might remember something called the Information Operations Roadmap, which I've talked about many times in the more distant past um, of this podcast, but it was a document that was released by the DOD back in 2003, which did note that information intended for foreign audiences, including public diplomacy and PSYOP, uh, increasingly is consumed by our domestic audience and vice versa. Um, but it argued that the distinction between foreign and domestic audiences becomes more a question of U.S. government intent rather than information dissemination practices. And that is the same information operations roadmap, which, if you have heard about it before, is the one that talked about needing to fight the net as if it were an enemy weapon system. So yeah, the government has been thinking about this for quite a long time. Um, and certainly uh, the smith Munt had nothing to do with stopping that or allowing that or anything of that sort. Um, we could get into other aspects of this, like in 2000 when it was revealed that, oh yes, CNN had active duty employed U.S. PSYOPs officers at its headquarters in Atlanta. Um, and that, that was part of a larger program involved that, which involved other networks using embedded PSYOPs officers in newsrooms around the country. <laughs> but don't worry about that, guys. Propaganda, domestic propaganda is illegal or restricted or something. Or don't worry, it's for your own good. <laughs> anyway, that's what Richard Stengel wants you to believe. Look, the way we combat disinformation and fake news is to just use domestic propaganda. Duh. <laughs> I mean, that's of course what we should be doing. And oh, we are. Good. All right. And I'm living embodiment of that. Former editor of Time, former undersecretary of state for public diplomacy. You know, those things go together perfectly, don't they? Well, they do in the system as it's been created for propagandizing you and uh, con trying to control what you think. So, Long story short, yes, it's no surprise that the CFR would host such a conference. But as I say, it is interesting, and I do recommend watching that full one, and, one hour and 17 minute panel as much as you can stomach, because there are some interesting moments in there, uh, including some talk about the gay frogs meme and... You know how do you how do you teach students uh, about how how so wrong and silly this is and blah blah blah, and some other interesting moments where uh, clearly I think they tip their hand to the fact that this is about setting an agenda and pushing an agenda rather than talking about facts and what is actually being talked about. Um, numerous different examples of that, but um, I'll let you go and watch that for yourself. Anyway. That's, again, perhaps no surprise to my regular audience, but I think it needs to be pointed out specifically. Uh, you can or you can have laws on the books that supposedly kind of prevent disinformation and propaganda being perpetuated by the U.S. government, kind of, in a way, kind of restrains them, ties their hands a little bit, or you can repeal it. Doesn't matter. Either way, propaganda is going to be used, deployed by the U.S. government against its own citizens, and realistically, every government against its own citizens. And you always have to be on guard for that. There is no way around that. But there is one more thing that we should do before we go here today. 41 up, 884 down. Hmm. I think we can do better than that, don't you think, Corbett Report community? Yeah, at least a little bit better. Yeah, that'll do it for today. James Corbett, CorbettReport.com.